Well, good morning. How are you guys? Hope your Thanksgiving gave you some time to give thanks for some things. You might have had a week where it might have been a little difficult to give thanks, depending on how your week has went. But we're here to talk about the one you were just singing about, our living hope. Hey, if you're new here, I want to welcome you to Hendersonville Church. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors, and it really is, I'm grateful to get to talk to you guys today. I get to talk to you about a scripture that is really near and dear to my heart, a book that God has used many times throughout the last many years. But if you are new here today, would you mind taking a second? There's a care card in the seat back in front of you. Would you fill it out and just let us know that you're here? We'd love to connect with you. Just say hi. You know how we can be praying for you. And if you have questions, that's a great place to put it. If you've got prayer requests, again, that's a place to put that on there. But I want to I wanna jump in because uh, I had 13 sermons prepared for today. And it's not because I'm good, I promise. I, I, there was just so much on my heart, and I was begging God, you got to... You got to show me what we've got time for and what you want your people to hear, what you want me to have to deal with too. Because let me, let me say this, you don't prepare a sermon and not have to go through it first yourself. Like I've, I've got I've to let it filter through me. I've got to I say, God, what is it you want to do in me and through me that you want to do? And so today, I want us to talk about John 15. John 15, and if you've got your Bibles or you've got your phones with you, it's a great time to go ahead and kind of get set up, but uh, we've been going through Acts maybe for a couple weeks. So those that have been with us for a little while, 27 weeks we've been going through the book of Acts, and man, it's been rich. It's been unbelievable. God's been telling us through the book of Acts how the church is really meant to grow and how it's meant to thrive. But this week we're taking just a jump. And we're going to talk about John 15. And before we do, we can't just jump in the middle without having some context. So I want to give you guys some context on what's going on here in John 15 and why we're going to talk about it today. Because it's unbelievably important. I think you're going to see that as we get into more of this. See, here we are in John 15. The author that we generally accept is uh, the disciple John. He's known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was one of the 12 that walked with Jesus for three years, and he spent day in and day out and day in and day out with him. He was part of an inner circle. If, if you know anything unrelationally, do you have like the inner circles that you have with uh, certain people? Certain people you tell certain things to, you trust them. Well, John was part of that inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And he had a different view of the relationship with Jesus. See, this was the fourth gospel, and it was a little different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was an eyewitness account, but it was so relational. It was unbelievable how John had put it in here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He gave this relational backdrop, this point of view that we did not see in the other gospels. It's a complete agreement, but yet a different perspective. So here we are in the chapters leading up to 15 so that we know what we're talking about and what was going on because that's important. In chapter 13, these guys all get together and the disciples are getting ready to have a meal. It's the last meal we read about in the gospel. In this meal, Jesus takes part of his clothes off and he starts to serve his disciples. He, He starts to wash their feet. Maybe you've heard this story, but he starts to wash their feet. He then, he tells them that he's going to be leaving. He starts to break the news to them. He also finds out, and he knows already, and he says to the rest of his disciples, hey, one of you all is going to betray me. Can you imagine spending three years, three years with the same guys and finding out here that one of them is going to betray him? You know why this is so important? This is Passion Week. And Passion Week really is just the week leading up to the cross where Jesus is crucified. So they've spent three years in ministry. Jesus has spent 33 years on the earth, and we're in the last week, and quite honestly, in the last hours of what he is talking to his disciples about. Not only does he tell them that Judas is going to betray him because he gets up and he leaves, and then Peter sticks his foot in his mouth, as he does sometimes, and he says, hey, I'll never leave. I'm going to go with you all the way. And Jesus looks at him and he says, you're going to deny me three times. Can you feel what these guys might have felt? Can you sense that? 
And as they're sitting there, Jesus then starts to comfort them. You can imagine why, because they're really sad. He starts to comfort them. He starts to, he starts to tell them, that, hey, I've got to go away. And he's already told them what's getting ready to happen. He's, he's getting ready to share with them, hey, this isn't exactly what you think is going to happen. I know you've been following me. You believe I'm king. That's good. But what you think is going to happen, it, listen, I'm going to tell you, it's going to end poorly. And you'll be sad, but I'm not going to leave you alone. And he promises the Holy Spirit. He promises the Holy Spirit. And that's where we pick up in 15, in the last verse of John 14, 31. He says this. Imagine this really hard news, and he says, rise. Let us go from here. He is resolved. And then that is the context for John 15. As we lead into this, he is talking to the 11 that are still there. Judas is now gone. He's on his way to betray Jesus. And he is en route to the cross. Do you think this time is pretty important? Can you imagine? Are you going to pick your words well? Do you think the next things you're going to say to your disciples are going to be really important? This is a long walk. They still have the garden to go to and then the cross. And this is where he starts in John 15, 1, if you would read with me. And we're gonna go slow, okay? Um, There is so much here. And I want us to hear what I believe God wants each and every one of us to hear today. He says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. First thing we notice is there's two roles. There's two roles that he identifies right out of the gate. There's the vine, who's Jesus, and there's the vine dresser, the one in charge of the whole garden, the one that's going to take care of the vine, take care of the branches. That's God the Father. These two roles are important, but let me say this. I think the first two words are even more important. He says, I am. He says, I am. Jesus is saying, I am. He's looking at his disciples saying, I am the true vine. Hey, do you know what it means when you say I am to the other person that you're saying it to? It means you're not. That's what it means. I am, you're not. I'm the boss, you're not. I'm the winner, you're not. Do you see just an easy understanding here? It's I am means that you're not. And you may not think that's a big deal, but I promise you this, Jesus was making it a point. That I am statement has so many implications, okay? And we do not have time. Like I said, 13 sermons in my head. We're only gonna stick to one, but this is what is key. That I am ties all the way back to the Old Testament. That I am, he made other statements within the book of John that I would encourage you to read. I would encourage you to read. He made seven I am statements. This is the last of the seven that are a metaphor. He says, I am and you are not. Why is that so important? Well, let me say it this way. How big of a deal do you think pride is and self-reliance? How big of an issue do you think that is in what Jesus is getting ready to tell him? He's saying, I'm the vine, the true vine. You are not. Let me, let me tell you something that God convicted me of, and, and, and this isn't new with me, so let me just share it with you. Let's see, we'll, we'll play this little, this little part out and see if you get the same thing I did. If, have you ever heard the name Samson? You ever heard of Samson? Maybe you've heard of the name back in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, okay? When you think of Samson, is he, uh, is he small and scrawny or is he really big and strong? Which one is he? Is he like, is he like the Hulk? I mean, it's, that's probably what we're thinking, right? I see nods. Yeah, when we see it, if you've seen movies, what do, what do they always portray Samson as? He's this big guy, really big guy. Do you ever wonder why the Philistines wondered where his strength came from? I mean, if there's this guy that was so big, why did they wonder where his strength came from? Would it blow your mind for him to be a five foot nine, 180 guy about my size? It would me. I, he convicted me. You know why? Because I started to look at it as I've looked at so many things in my life. See, God takes my talents and my gifts that he gives me, my natural abilities, he kind of sprinkles stuff on it, makes it better. That is a lie. That is a lie. Samson could have been my size. We don't know because guess what? Reading the book of Judges, the only thing we hear about is his hair. We don't get any physical attributes about Samson. We just start to think that he played a really big part because he was a big guy. We don't know that. 
And it leads us to this. As we think through it, you will never know enough, be enough, or do enough to get God's attention. You won't. You won't be in that spot. Here's the, here's the other problem we run into. Number one, we gotta get our self, our pride, our reliance, our wealth, our networking, our smarts, we gotta get them out of the way. And you may think, well, I've been trying to do that. Well, I'll, I'll even help you one step further. We can't. We're gonna talk about that some more. You can't. We don't know how to function without putting ourselves kind of in the primary role. And if he says true vine, why does he say true? Like, I don't, I don't get it. Why does he say true? Unless there's false vines. What if there's false vines? How many false vines? Who knows? Who knows? But here's one thing I want us to look at. If there's a true vine, one, and there's multi, any other vine is what? By definition. False. It's false. It's false, even including the good ones that I think are all about me. See, here's the deal. You can try to go study all the false vines if you want, but that's not the path that Jesus is talking about. And we're gonna see by the end of this scripture, Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, and I want you to spend your time with me. I want you to spend your time with me. If you wanna know a fake, study the original. If you wanna know the fake, study the original. You'll never see all the fakes, but study the original. There's three main enemies that we have vines that get attached to. And I'm going to lump them into these three. The flesh, the carnal side of me, the things I want, the things I think I need. The me, 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 I, I, I. That's the flesh. The world is another one. Not the earth, not the dirt. You don't go grab a handful and say that's evil. Here's the deal. The world system, the way things work and the way you think they have to work. The where you put yourself in the middle of that world system. If you've got your vine stuck in those and that's your vine, we got a problem. And then the third one, which gets most of the credit for all of it, but it's really not, is Satan. He is the enemy of God. And pride is the thing that blinded him most. But understand this, there are three enemies. There's you and the flesh, the world, and Satan. That's things like, let me put a little teeth to it, that's things like religion. Jesus was not a big fan of religion, by the way, okay? He did not say nice things about religion, and I'm standing up here in a church, and people are like, oh, my gosh. You're saying that about religion? This isn't about religion. If you've been here at all, you, you know this is not about religion or religious activities. It's not about tradition. Hey, tradition isn't a bad thing, but, boy, when that becomes your vine, it's real bad. What about legalism, moralism, just to act better, be better, heritage, my family's been going to church for decades. Great. Great. Do you want to know the starting point that Jesus says in two words? I am. Your starting point is complete and utter dependence on the person of Christ. Your starting point is the complete dependence on Jesus Christ. If you don't start there, this doesn't work. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm, I'm giving you the starting blocks because I want you to hear this as, so clear that Jesus talks about. The two roles, the vine is the one that gives life to the branches. The vine dresser is the one that directs and cares for the vine and the branches. Here's the roles that he gives us in the first verse. He is the one that takes it and moves it back to the vine. All right, John 15, two, here's, we're gonna jump in. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that he may bear more fruit. Well, right out of the gate, we see two different branches. Do you notice that? There's two different branches, the ones that have fruit and the ones that don't have the fruit that he's talking about. I, I had to sit with this for a little while because I gave you that context earlier. Who was the one that defected? Who was the one that turned Jesus in? Do you remember? It's Judas, right? Judas. Do you know how long Judas spent with Jesus? as long as the rest of them did. He was with them for years. Do you know that Judas was around him all the time? Not only that, he handled the money for him. He saw the miracles. He saw the healings. He heard the good words that Jesus gave. He was with them all the time, right? Wouldn't that mean that Jesus and Judas were besties? Wouldn't that mean that? I mean, they hung out all the time. Let me, let me say this, if Judas could be with Jesus for three years and not have real fruit, 
you think coming to church every week is going to save you? Do you think the church makes you a Christian? Do you think Bible studies make you a Christian? Listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not hollering at you. God has put this on my heart so strong this week. Listen, those things don't make you a Christian. If Judas could hang with Jesus every day for three years and see everything he saw, don't you think it's time for a second to step back and go, man, whew, I don't want to just assume. I don't want to just take it because here's the deal. Serving doesn't make you a Christian. Giving money to the church doesn't make you a Christian. Doing religious activities does not make you a Christian. By the way, having a heritage of being in the church or pastors in your family or anything else doesn't make you a Christian. you know why? Because there's no mention of God having grandkids in the Bible. There's no grandkids. They're either children or not. Let me sum it up in something I've had to remember so tight in my heart is this. Proximity does not equal intimacy. Proximity does not equal intimacy. Just being with and around someone does not mean your heart's really attached to that. It doesn't mean there's a relationship there. There's more that has to take place. Let me show you what I mean. Jesus had some more words in Matthew 7. He says it this way. 7, 16, and 17. You will recognize them by their fruits. You think your fruits are important? Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. I mean, he's saying this again. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. First thing I want you to hear me say, fruits are not a checkbox. You don't have a sheet of, oh, did I have that fruit today? Did I get this fruit today? Did I? They are an evidence of what you're rooted in. They're an evidence of what you're rooted in. In this world, we are so focused. For years of my life, I was so focused on, guess what? My fruit. I was so focused. Did I produce enough? Did I get enough? Did I do enough? The world system will tell you you're only as good as what you produce. What'd you produce today? Almost 20 years in corporate America, I promise I could tell you some stories about it. Bottom line was this. My value and worth was all attached to what I produced. And it was a lie. It was a lie. It was a lie. Branches are good for two things. If you think about it, just tangibly. They're good for fruit or they're good for fuel. They're good for fruit or they're good for fuel. You gather them and you throw them into the fire. And let me say it this way. Do you think you can change your fruit, by the way? Do you think you can change your fruit? Do you think an apple tree can just decide, today I'm going to produce some oranges? Do you think so? Or grapevine just start producing figs? Isn't it silly for us to think that we can change our own fruit, that we can kind of modify and move it around, we can change our own fruit? Here's, Here's another just an easy way to remember this. For me, I've had to say this over and over again. So I don't focus on my fruit as a to do, but as an evidence. If you have a fruit problem, you have a root problem. If you have a fruit problem, you have a root problem. It's not as simple as going, my apples are kind of not real good, so I probably should do a little something to make them better. If I start to look at my fruit as evidence of where my root is, I start to look at the real root problem instead of treating the symptoms. See, the fruit reflects your root. Now, I'm going to dance around a little bit because this has danced on my toes all week. How much time do you spend taping grapes on your, your branch? Hey, do you, man, it's, it's real quiet. I can hear the air. And I promise I didn't want to bring a hard message this week. I promise I didn't. God has convicted me so through this week. Do we know what people in a church expect? Oh, you gotta be nice, right? You gotta be kind. We come in. Are you, how much time are you spend in taking a couple grapes on before you come to group or before you go to church, before you talk to somebody on the phone? You know, listen, we 
don't want to look like we're producing, right? You want to look like you, you belong, right? You don't want people to know. It's a natural thing. You know what that is inside of you? Your pride. It's your pride. It's my pride that keeps me from being able to see. And let me tell you this. If you've been taping grapes, and I have spent time taping grapes to my branch, you may fool you. You may fool the people sitting next to you you're doing life with. Maybe. Probably not, but maybe. But you know who you're not going to fool? The vine dresser. You're not going to fool the vine dresser. You know why? Because his entire job is to care for the vine and the branch and to make sure that they're fruitful. You know what he says about this in Galatians? So the Apostle Paul writes this in Galatians. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, remember one of those enemies? One of those false vines? Will reap corruption. But one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. It seems pretty clear, right? <clears throat> it seems pretty clear. There are fruit. It's not just unfruitful. There's fruit on both sides. You've got false vine fruit and you've got true vine fruit. And the thing that determines it is what are you rooted in? So if you want to know a little bit better picture of what that looks like, Paul goes on to talk about this. He wants to make it abundantly clear that we know that we can take a real inventory of our fruit, not try to change it, take an inventory of it. He says this in Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He didn't even finish the list. But I think you might get the flow. You get the idea? I warn you as I've warned you before. It's not the first time he said this. As I've warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me sum up those things. If you're starting to go, well, yeah, I don't think mine was on there. Okay, okay. If you hear me say anything, this isn't about creating a list. Please hear me say it is not about creating a list. It's not about boxes. Where is your root in and what is coming out the other end? Because I can tell you this, if, you're, if your vine is attached and it's not the true vine, you are going to see these things that are all about your kingdom, your righteousness, and what you want. That's what it's going to be. That's what it's going to be. Sum it up at this. It's all about you. It's all about you. Your kingdom, not the kind of grapes that God wants in his, not the fruit of the Spirit. And so we want to know what is the fruit of the Spirit. Paul gives us a very clear picture again in Galatians 5. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. <clears throat> and those who belong to Christ, belong to who? They belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh you see, with its passions and desires. It is the evidence, the fruit is the evidence of whose you are. It is not a task list of what to do to be something. It is evidence of who you are. Now, if you hear that and you are greatly disturbed right now because you think, well, I've got good fruit, I've got some good fruit, but I don't have all those fruits. By the way, it's not plural, it's, it's singular. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You don't get to pick and choose. I'll take an orange, I'll take an apple this week, I need a little bit more of this. Here's the deal. It is the fruit of the Spirit. You should see these. If you're a child of God, these should be evident in some level. And if you're like, man, I need to be more like that. He thinks so too. Don't you realize I've had to, I've had to take a self-inventory this week and go, man, it's unbelievable. Some of these areas in my life, I wish, I really do. I, I desire more fruit in this area. I desire more fruit. And the key is this, it's progress, not perfection. It is progress, not perfection. If you're sitting there going, well, I don't have all those and I'm not completely full. Have you ever seen a grapevine get planted day one and day two? All of a sudden, all the branches pop out and they have grapes on them. Have you ever seen that? 
Because, man, that would really shorten the time for all the people who are grape growers. Are you expecting something that would come from 20 years? Ever seen a mature vine that's this big around at a vineyard? You ever see the, the new ones? They're, they're that big? They can't even hold the weight of the, of the mature grapes. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's progress, not perfection. If I look back on my life five years ago, I can see places that God has been growing my heart, my mind, and the fruit that he has in me. And you know what? I don't take pride in that. I realize how much further I have to go. I realize how much more God wants to do in that. Not how good my fruit is. Takes us to verse two in John 15. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. If you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, let me give you a, a little bit of a, a, a sneak peek at what's coming. You're gonna get pruned. You're gonna get pruned. Your life isn't gonna be, except Jesus, everything's gonna be great. That's not the story that Jesus gave any of the people that followed him. That's not what he told anybody. You could clearly argue and say that he told them the opposite of that. But one of the things he does when a branch is in him, guess what he does? He, the father starts pruning it. So what is pruning? If you've ever heard this, if you've got a green thumb, you already know a little bit about pruning, but here's the deal. It's a very simple process, but it takes someone with a ton of knowledge to know how to do it and do it well. Pruning is the cutting back or cutting off of parts so that there's better shape and more fruitful growth. That's a simple way to just remember it. It's cutting back or cutting off. Now, does that sound fun? Hey, come to Jesus. Get your arms chopped off. Huh, does that sound good? Come to Jesus, it's gonna get a lot harder. Let me say it this way. Have you ever seen a branch prune itself? You ever looked out in the yard and saw a tree pruning itself? You know how often I hear somebody tell me they got to get better at something? Man, I got I to gotta get better at that. I got to get better at that. I, I, I've said that. I've said it. I've said it. I said it for years. I got to get better at loving people, man. God says that I'm going to be known by the way I love people. And I could see a gap in my heart. I, I didn't love them. I, sometimes I struggled to like them. Do you know why? Because they weren't very lovable. Do you know what proof it is if you love people that are easy to be loved? Now, you're human. They're nice to me. I'll be nice to them. I guess I love them. You know what Jesus did? He loved his enemies. He loved the people that weren't along with him. That's what he told the rest of the disciples. He told a group of people, man, that you turn the cheek and you do these things that are really hard. And I kept thinking, what must be going on in their heart and their mind to be okay with that? You know what it is? The Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not connected to the vine, that sounds like absurdity. And if you think you can self-modify, sin behavior modify your way to having these fruits, it's a lie. Let me let some weight off of you right now. That's never going to happen. We struggle to take care of just bad habits on our own, and we never get it whipped on our own. And we think we're going to change our heart? You think you're going to make those things happen? You, you don't prune yourself. Why do you think he said the vine dresser is there? God the Father knows you. If you're a child of God, he knows who you are. He knows the best way to prune you, and he's not expecting you to sit around and make a list of things you need to change about yourself. You know what he wants you to do? We're gonna get to it. You are not here to fix yourself. If you could fix yourself, Jesus Christ did not need to come. If you could be perfect on your own, Jesus didn't need to come. So what is it that gets pruned in our life? You may ask the question, well, what gets pruned? Well, let me give you just a three-word quick summary that I hope sticks with you a little bit when you think about this. It's the three Ds of pruning. There's five Ds, there's four Ds. Depends on what you're pruning, but let me just use these because it kind of covers the basis. The three Ds, dead, diseased, or damaged. Dead, diseased, or damaged. What does God want to prune out of your life? 
the things that are dead, diseased, or damaged. By the way, do you want to hold on to the things that are dead, diseased, and damaged? Is that what you're, are you holding it like this going, don't touch my dead stuff. Don't touch my diseased and damaged stuff. I love it. That sounds funny, but you know what I mean by that, right? Have you ever kind of just held it close to the vest? You're like, I don't want you to take that. I don't want you to take it. And you hear this pruning thing, you're like, people really want this? People really agree with this? This sounds crazy. Well, the good news is Scripture is pretty clear of why this is a good thing. In Hebrews 12, the writer of Hebrews tells us this, for the moment of all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. No kidding. How'd that work growing up? But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Pruning and, dis and, and discipline lead to fruitful righteousness. Do you see that if you're allowing yourself to be trained by it, you're allowing yourself to be trained by it? Do you, do you think you could get discipline and pruning and just go, I'm growing that back? I'm growing it back. You're not trained by it. I have been an expert in many of these spots where I, I feel like I was being disciplined and pruned and I just said, no, I'm too stubborn. My pride's in the way. I'm gonna make that work. The other thing that this discipline and pruning shows is that you belong to God. See, in Hebrews 12, seven, here's what he tells us. For it is, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Man, that is tough. Because you know what that means? If you've never experienced the pruning or discipline of God in your life, you have a reason to be concerned. You have a reason to be concerned. My neighbors never came over and disciplined me. I don't go over to my neighbor's house and discipline their children. You know who I discipline? My kids. You know who God disciplines? His. We're gonna wrap up with these last verses through verse eight in John 15, three, starting there. Already you have, you are clean because of the word that I've spoke to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, Jesus says, and you are are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If you've been here a while, you've heard that a few times. If anyone does not abide in me and he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. He continues, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I'm not sure how accustomed you are to the word abide, but Jesus felt like in this context, in this time, walking towards the cross, he wanted to say it 10 times in 10 verses. Jesus said, abide in me 10 times in 10 verses. Do you think that's important? Do you think it's important? He didn't say grow your own fruit and get it good. He said, abide in me. He said, abide in me. By the way, you might be well, like, I don't think, I don't know really what that all means. Let me just say it this way, okay? Let me break down abide pretty easy. It's to remain, to stay, to live with, to dwell with. And the way that my simple mind works is this. What are you marinating in? What you soaking in? Huh? What, what are you soaking in? What are you marinating in? We can leave those other words off to the side. What do you sit and soak in? What, what if I said that your relationship with Jesus is like a hot cup of water, okay? And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm hot water. And Jesus is the tea bag. How much does your water taste like Jesus? Is it, you just dip it a little bit, just dip it, kind of get it going. Man, I dipped it three times, it should be good today. Should be good. Hey, do you drink tea so that it tastes like hot water or you drink tea because it tastes like tea? 
Do you want to look more like Jesus? Do you want the fruit that Jesus is talking about in the vine that the vine dresser says brings glory to him and proves that you're a disciple? Guess what? Dip in the bag three times in a day, a little quiet time, a little prayer on the way. I ain't making any fun of it. But he didn't say, do your quiet time with me 10 times. He said, abide in me. Abide in me. Do you see that this isn't the same? We talk about things that are a totally different vernacular than what Jesus said. He said, I, I want you to be with me. He wants you to stick the tea bag in and let it sit. And not go, well, today's a little rush, so I'm going to pull it out. It should sit in there about three minutes or four minutes, but I'm, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to squeeze this. I'm going to squeeze it. Oh, I'm going to squeeze it. Does that taste good, by the way? No. Do you realize that when the, the hot water and the tea bag get to spend time together, what happens? That water becomes tea. It smells like it, it tastes like it, it acts like it, it has the characteristics of it. What you marinating in? What in the world are we marinating in? Do you understand your fruit is gonna taste like whatever you're marinating in? I wanna, I wanna take some weight off of you. Stop trying to adjust the symptoms of the issue and let's look at the root cause. Your fruit's gonna taste like whatever it is you're marinating in. What's the things your thoughts are all about all day long? What's your mind racing on? What's your heart confused with? Where's your finances? Where's your calendar? Where's your stuff? Where's all the things that are important to you? Where are they aligned? What are they marinating in? When you close your eyes at night, what is the thing you're thinking about on your way to sleep? I wanna sum this up in two different things, okay? I'm gonna make a broad stroke and then we're gonna get a little closer. The first one is this. Here's what I'm, th I'm, I'm telling you. Jesus is wanting us to see and in our terms, this is what I want us to look at. It is be versus do. Be versus do. We're in a world of do. What you doing? How much did you do? It's all about production, right? We're all about production. Jesus is like, hey, man, it ain't about your production. I am the true vine. He says this, be and do. The first one is this. He wants you to be a child. Be a child of God. Be a real child of God. Not just do the things that make you look like one. You're not fooling anybody, especially not the vine dresser. He wants you to be a child, a real child of God. And if you already know that you're there, that you have that relationship, the evidence is clear, then he says this, I want, you to, I want you to progressively be a fruit that is, that is, I want you to be progressively fruitful. Progressively fruitful. Not just doing, but being, abiding with Jesus. The only way you produce more fruit is spending more time with him. The only way you produce more fruit is spending more time with him. And the last thing that I think he is summing up here before we get real specific is this. Be a disciple do you see in that last verse that he says this, thus proving that you're a disciple? Be a disciple, not just doing good deeds. We can get so hung up in doing good deeds. Guess what Jesus did all the time? Guess what Jesus did? One thing, he did all the time. One thing. He didn't heal all the time. He didn't go all the time. He didn't stay all the time. You know what he did all the time, every time, 100% of the time? The will of the Father. He abided perfectly in the Father. He did what the Father said and what the Father told him to do. That's all he did. Be a disciple, not doing good deeds, but being obedient to the Father. So here's where we get application. Getting information in our head is not gonna save anybody. It's about transformation. It's the point of the Bible. It's to get it into us so that it changes us through the Holy Spirit, we're gonna take a little fruit inventory and we're gonna take an application for this, okay? The first one up there is this. There's a couple bus buckets that have been identified within these small couple verses. It's this. There's the Christians that have some fruit, some fruit. We're not gonna sit and quantify it, but there's some. There's some there. It's, you're a new Christian. You're early in your walk. You may have been doing it for 20 years and still be a one-year-old Christian. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I'll say this. That's for you to decide with God, to spend some time with God. But some fruit lets me know that I'm a Christian. I belong there. I'm getting it from the true vine. What's your next step? To accept abiding and pruning. 
Do you know the first time that snip happens, you start to do this? Ooh, man. Don't you think that the first time you feel something that feels bad, you want to push back from it? Isn't it odd to have something that hurts and then kind of just accept it, not to fight back? What's the next step? Well, then you have the more fruit. Once you accept the pruning and the abiding, you have the more fruit. That's a maturing Christian, a Christian that is growing. And what's the next step for somebody in that box? Well, let me tell you, that's agreeing. And this may sound the same, but it's not. Agreeing with the pruning and the abiding. Agreeing with the abiding and the pruning. What's the difference? I can accept something and not fully agree with it. Do you know what I mean by that? I can accept something that that's just the way it is. And I'll, I'll, I'll okay. But then the next step is in trust and faith. Guess what? I start to agree with it. I want that to happen. I agree with what is happening. And then we look at the next one, which is much fruit. Much fruit is a disciple of Jesus. He tells us this in that verse. Prove to be a disciple by having much fruit to the glory to God the Father. What's your next step? Continue to embrace abiding and pruning. Wouldn't it look crazy for somebody to be pruning you and you you reach out and you grab them like this because it's what you desire It's what you want. It's what your heart wants. It's not just the thing to do. It's not just accept it as the way forward or even an agreement, but you embrace it. You literally embrace the pruning and the abiding, not because somebody told you so, but because that's the God of the universe who wants to spend time with you and make you more fruitful. He wants the dead, the dying, the diseased, and the damaged stuff out of your life. Don't you want it out of your life? If you don't, it's not gonna happen. And we come to the last one is this. It's no fruit. And let me tell you, I, this is scary as stuff. This is scary stuff. Jesus said hard things. So we're not going to shy away from it, but he said no fruit. Listen, it is not my job to judge you at all. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I'm just providing what Jesus said. But if you have no fruit, in keeping with the true vine, the evidence points to it's in a false vine. And there's no way you can read the scriptures we read today and say, oh, I feel really good about that. Your fruit is evidence. What's your next step? To repent and believe in the Son of God. That is the next step. You can't abide in someone you do not know. Don't you think that's, does that sound true? Can you abide in someone you don't know? Can you have a relationship with somebody truly that you don't know? Jesus knows this. He spent three years telling his disciples and a whole lot more people who he was, who he is, the living hope we just sang about at the end. He's not dead, he's alive. Guess what? Those I am statements all through John, he made it abundantly clear. Who is he? Who is he? He says it this way. He says this in John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know me and have seen him. Every single person in this room right now should be able to attach to one of those things we talked about. No fruit, some fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Every one of them provides a next step. How do we, how do we take this next step of growth? You don't do, you be. He's abundantly clear on how this works. And here's what I wanna do. Here's what I want to do right now. I want to be able to pray for us. And I'm telling you, if you've been taping on fruit and you think you're fooling somebody, you're fooling yourself, you're fooling other people, God's not fooled. I care far more about your eternity than I care about your preference right now. Or whether you like me as a pastor, whether you like what I'm saying today or any of those other things. He's made it abundantly clear. If you don't know for sure that you know who Jesus is, I'm asking you. On behalf of of what Jesus said in his last hours with his disciples, 
with Judas who had hung out with him for three years and still did not know the real Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. Let me ask you this. What's it going to take? What's it going to take for you to commit to the next, either accepting pruning, agree with the pruning, or embrace the pruning and the abiding? Do you know what's missing from all of this is the doing. There's no doing. It's being. Being with the one that when you're with them and you let that tea bag soak in your water, guess what? You taste like, you smell like, you act like, you talk like the one you spend time with. Jesus wants you to marinate in him and soak in him. I'm going to pray for us. And I want to, I while I'm doing this, Chloe's going to just, she's just going to play a song. And I want to give you an opportunity to do this. If you desire, only if you desire, if you personally desire, if you want to put feet to what that next step is for you, there is nothing special about this stage. If anything, it's kind of hard to get down off of without something to, to brace us. There's nothing special about this stage or this room or anything else. There is something special about you taking a step towards Jesus Christ and whatever he has put on your heart. He, Revelation, he said he stands at the door and he knocks. He knocks. He knocks at the door and he's waiting to see if you'll answer, if you'll just open the door. You're like, well, I'm not good enough. I can't be good enough. Go back to slide one. You will never be good enough. You are not the true vine. Jesus Christ is. I'm gonna pray for us, and during this time, if you would like to come and talk with Jesus, if you would like to take that next step, for you personally, please, this, this whole front stage is open for you to do that. Let me pray for us. Father God, I'm, I'm really just grateful for your Holy Spirit, God, that you don't leave us alone. You told your disciples, I'm going away, and they were sad. They were really sad is they loved you and they spent time with you. And you said, I'm not gonna leave you alone. God, would your Holy Spirit have its way in this room right now? God, if you are moving hearts and you're moving minds and you're moving them closer to you, God, would you just peel off the stuff that's holding them back? God, it's not about me or Nathan or Hendersonville Church or anything else, it's about you. You are the true vine. God, that they would make a step in their relationship with you. God, that they would trust you. If they've never trusted you as their Lord and Savior, God, that they would, they would repent of what they've done and believe on you as their Lord and Savior. It's simple, but it's not easy. God, would you move hearts to take one step closer to you that they may be more fruitful. God, we leave all of this in your capable hands, God. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.